Hello wonderful people, it's Medicosis Perfectionitis where medicine makes perfect sense. This video is brought to you by True Learn Question Bank, where you can practice thousands of questions with answers and explanation. You'll find a complete playlist on my channel titled Cases, where you can watch many videos like this one. In this video, we'll talk about neuro cases. So bring a pen and paper and let's see how many of today's question you'll answer correctly. You can try True Learn Question bank for free by simply clicking on this link in the description or using promo code medicosis to get a $25 discount on your subscription. Let's get into it. Here is case number one. Please pause the video, read it and try to answer it yourself. Now pause. Let's go. A 27-year-old man is brought to the emergency department following a motor vehicle accident in which he was an unrestrained passenger. The patient appears to be confused as he does not remember the accident. He reports that he has facial pain and severe headache. He denies any alcohol or drugs. His temperature is okay, pulse is a little high, respiration high, blood pressure high. Pulse ox, well that's a good oxygen saturation right there. The patient has cervical spine tenderness, anterior chest wall tenderness, right leg pain, abrasions, large forehead hematoma, broken teeth, and an erythematous swollen face. After the patient is stabilized, he undergoes a CT scan of the head, face, neck, and cervical spine that shows a fracture of the crista galli. Which of the following structures is the most likely affected by this fracture? Is it middle meningeal artery, cranial nerve 3, cranial nerve 1, cranial nerve 5, cranial nerve 10, or the vertebral artery? The correct answer here is the olfactory nerve or cranial nerve number one. Why is that? First of all, do you know what the word crista galli even means? It means the crest of a rooster. If I draw a forehead like this and then a nose and then a mouth and chin, let's continue the skull. Amazing. What's the name of this point right here? This is your nasion. And how about the point right here? That's your inion. From beginning to end, from cradle to grave, from top to bottom, and from nasion to inion. Let's drill deep into that nasion. What will you find? I'll find the famous bone known as the ethmoid bone. Here's a question for you. Is the ethmoid bone a singular structure or a paired structure? Do you have one ethmoid bone or two? The answer is unequivocally one ethmoid bone in the midline. Let's try to look at the back of the ethmoid bone from this angle. So I'm going to look at the posterior aspect of the ethmoid bone, which is here. How do we draw an ethmoid bone? It looks like this. All right. Do, 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 do. And then something like this. It's a weird looking bone. And like this, like this, like this like a butterfly. And then we'll have the superior nasal concha and the middle nasal concha. What's that thing in the middle? This is the perpendicular plate. If you go up, 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 that's the crest of the rooster. This is the crista galli. Let's use the blue color for the crista galli. Where would that be in the skull from this view? It will be right here. Okay, why should we care about the crista galli that much? Because the olfactory nerve is on the left and the right of the crista galli. Here's your left olfactory nerve and the right olfactory nerve. It's not actually the nerve, it's the olfactory bulb that lies on both sides of the crista galli. So, right near here, there is an olfactory bulb and an olfactory bulb. If I was involved in a car accident and fracture my crista galli, who's gonna suffer? Olfactory bulbs. And these belong to cranial nerve number one, which is the olfactory nerve. Here is an important rule in neurology, and this applies for cranial nerve one and cranial nerve two. You start with the nerve itself amazing and then after the nerve you have a bulb after the bulb you have a tract after the tract you have a part of your forebrain okay in case of the olfactory nerve what is this this is the olfactory nerve itself what is that called olfactory bulb what's that called olfactory tract and what's that part of the forebrain? That's the telencephalon. But what if this was cranial nerve number two? Now what? This will be your optic nerve. This is the optic bulb, but we do not say optic bulb. We say optic chiasm. And this will be the optic tract. And this will be the diencephalon, which is part of the thalamus, namely the lateral geniculate body. 
These are the fibers of the olfactory nerve, which start from between the cells of the olfactory mucosa in the roof of my nose. Then the olfactory nerve fibers, then olfactory bulb, olfactory tract, telencephalon, forebrain. Okay, here's an olfactory bulb on the right side. There is another one on the left side. Between them, there is the crista galli that I fractured. So the answer to the previous question is olfactory nerve. Next, question number two. Please pause. Let's do it together. A 24-year-old woman presents to the office with numbness and tingling in her right hand. She frequently feels a pins and needles sensation in her medial two fingers. She regularly competes in triathlons and notes that these symptoms are often worse after long training rides on her bicycle. She has no other medical history and does not take any medications. She does not use alcohol, tobacco, or illicit drugs. She has diminished sensation in her medial two fingers on the right hand. Strength with abduction and adduction of the fingers is 3 out of 5, so diminished in the right hand, but the left hand is fine. The remainder of the examination is unremarkable. The patient's symptoms likely caused by compression of a nerve that originates from which of the following spinal roots. What I would like to do is to draw her right hand, the hand that has a problem, in the anatomical position like this. We have diminished sensations in her medial two and a half fingers right here. What's the name of the nerve that carries sensations from the medial two fingers or one and a half fingers? If you say ulnar nerve, you're absolutely correct. Now, when they mention that the strength with abduction and adduction of the fingers is weakened, what does that mean? It means that my palmar interossei and dorsal interossei are weak. The palmar interossei are responsible for adduction, whereas the Dorsal interossei are for abduction. Both palmar and dorsal interossei are supplied by the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve takes care of the palmar interossei and the dorsal interossei. So now I know that she has a problem in her ulnar nerve on the right side. Why did they mention riding the bicycle? Well, this is called Guyon Canal Syndrome. While riding the bicycle, I'm holding the handle. This can compress the medial aspect of the hand and the wrist, which can compress the ulnar nerve. Now let's review your brachial plexus. What is the root value for the ulnar nerve? Answer, it is C8 and T1, i.e. the lowermost part of the brachial plexus. Because you will recall that the brachial plexus extends from C5 all the way until T1. At C8 and T1, the ulnar nerve is going to emerge. Let's review more of your brachial plexus. How about the musculocutaneous nerve? What's the root value for that? It is C5, C6, and C7. How about the axillary nerve? C5 and 6 only. How about the radial nerve? Now, that's a huge one. It is C5, C6, C7, C8, and even T1. The radial nerve is rambunctious. How about the ulnar nerve? Ulnar nerve is C8 and T1. Or you can say C7, C8, and T1. But C7 is not that constant. So I'm going with C8 as the correct answer. If you want to learn more about the brachial plexus, I have talked about it in detail in my video titled Anatomy of the Upper Limbs, and you can find it in my anatomy playlist. Question number three, please pause and read. Let's go. A 39-year-old woman is brought to the emergency department following a seizure. She has no past medical history. Imaging shows a single brain mass and neurosurgery is consulted. The patient undergoes surgical resection of the tumor and a biopsy specimen is viewed under light microscopy as shown in this image. The question is, which of the following statements best describes the underlying cause of this patient's symptoms? First, here's the thing. Before you read the choices, try to guess the answer first. Okay, so we have a seizure. We have a brain mass. Oh, so it's a space-occupying lesion causing a seizure. It could be a tumor. And yes, it is a tumor. The biopsy of the tumor is shown here. What do you notice? I notice these circular, spherical, whirly things known as samoma bodies. And what are these? Layered or laminated 
concentric spheres or spherules with dystrophic calcification. So, circular calcifications, basically. What are the diseases that have samoma bodies? First of all, samoma bodies are not unique to one disease. They can be found in many diseases. For example, any disease in pathology that has the word papillary in it, such as papillary thyroid cancer, intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm in the pancreas, papillary carcinomas of the breast, and any papillary disease. Ovarian serous cystadenocarcinoma, serous endometrial carcinoma, prolactinomas, meningiomas, somatostatinomas, etc., etc., etc. What's the name of the brain tumor that has samoma bodies? I just said meningioma. And meningioma, look at the word, meningioma. I have a problem in the meninges, okay? And oma means a tumor. There is a rule in pathology that says, if it ends in oma, it's a tumor, except Oklahoma. So I have a tumor in the meninges. What are the meninges? I have three meninges. There is the pia mater, there is the arachnoid mater, and there is the dura mater. So I want you to read the choices and tell me which one makes the most sense. How about B? brain mass originating from arachnoid cell. Yeah, the arachnoid mater is one of the meninges. Now for this question, question three, can you please tell me what about the incorrect answers? What are they describing? What is the disease described by choice A? How about C? How about D? How about E? Please let me know your answer in the comments. And here is question number four. Please pause. A 33-year-old woman presents to the hospital in labor. This is her second pregnancy, and she's currently at 40 weeks gestation. Her past medical history is remarkable for diabetes, oh, that's always important, which has been controlled with insulin during this pregnancy. Her pregnancy has been otherwise unremarkable. Newborn baby is born via spontaneous vaginal delivery. Look at this baby's weight, 4.5 kilograms, 9 pounds and 14 ounces, almost 10 pounds. That's a big baby. Heart rate is 140, respiration is 40, good oxygen saturation. The physician notes that his left arm is pronated and medially rotated. So let's draw a baby right here real quick. Look at the right arm, look at the right arm, look at the right arm. Oh, what is that called? This is the waiter's tip. Pronated instead of supinated, medially rotated or internally rotated rather than externally rotated. Can I flex this elbow? No, I cannot flex my elbow. Oh, I cannot flex the elbow and I cannot supinate. I wonder what is damaged. Uh, well, the biceps muscle. The biceps cannot do anything, which means the musculocutaneous nerve is one of the nerves that was damaged. What's the root value for the musculocutaneous nerve? If you say C5 and C6, you're absolutely correct. So herb palsy, there is a mnemonic that says herb is a problem in the upper roots of the brachial plexus. ER is here and ER is there. And since the brachial plexus starts at C5 and goes all the way until T1, the upper roots include C5 and C6, making B the correct answer. In this upper roots, C5 and C6 got damaged. Besides the musculocutaneous nerve, what else got damaged? How about the suprascapular nerve? What's the function of the suprascapular nerve anyway? It supplies the supraspinatus muscle, and the supraspinatus is responsible for abduction of the shoulder from 0 to 15. Can this kid abduct the shoulder? No, that's why I am adducting instead. Shoulder adduction is a classic sign of herb Duchenne palsy. Why did this happen? Shoulder dystocia. This baby is big. He had hard time passing through the birth canal. During maneuvering, the head was pushed this way, the rest of the body was pushed that way, and this tore the upper trunk of the brachial plexus, C5 and C6 roots. This baby was big, macrosomia, because the mother had diabetes during pregnancy. How does that happen? Why is the infant of a diabetic mother macrosomic? Why is the baby big? Because if mommy has diabetes, mommy has hyperglycemia. Too much sugar in the mother's blood. This sugar will cross the placenta from the mother's side to the baby's side. Now the baby has too much sugar. Who's gonna feel the sugar? Who's gonna sense the sugar? The pancreas will. The pancreas will say, oh my goodness, all of that sugar I gotta deal with? Yeah, so I need hyperplasia of the beta cells because I need to secrete 
more insulin. Even though mommy's pancreas might be in trouble, the baby's pancreas is robust, secreting too much insulin. And when there is too much insulin, insulin will leave the blood and go to the cell. As insulin leaves the blood, the baby develops hypoglycemia. As insulin goes into the cell, it gets converted to fat in the adipose tissue because insulin feeds the fat. The end result is macrosomia, increased body weight. And recall that insulin always asks the target cell to open its mouth and take in five substances. Number one, glucose is going to enter into the cell. Number two, potassium is going to enter into the cell. Number three, phosphate is going to enter into the cell. Number four, amino acids. And number five, free fatty acids. When everything is going inside my adipose tissue, guess what's going to happen? I will become a big baby, which increases my risk of injury during birth. So how many questions did you get right today? Did you get one, two, three, or all of them? Let me know in the comments. What I like about True Learn is that it's not just a question bank, but they also give you very good explanations after each question, and sometimes with summary tables like this. This one summarizes Marfan syndrome. You get to learn about the genetic defect, the clinical features, and the complications. And not just that, sometimes they show you the picmonic for the disease in the explanation below the question, such as Marfan syndrome. You can see that the defect is in the fibrillin 1 protein, frog with number 1. You can appreciate the arachnodactyly, the pectus excavatum, excavator, the mitral valve prolapse, and the aortic regurgitation. Whether you're studying for a USMLE or COMLEX, whether you're studying to become a doctor, physician assistant, nurse, nurse practitioner, occupational therapist, pharmacist, etc., they have a question bank for you. Even for specialty certification and recertification programs, they have questions banks for that as well. Just click on this link in the description or in the comments to start practicing today. TrueLearn has thousands of questions. You can sort by the degree of difficulty on a scale from 1 to 10, 1 being the easiest and 10 the hardest. So you can practice your way up to perfection. You can answer as many questions as you want on a specific topic, such as tuberculosis. You just type in tuberculosis and they will give you all the questions that they have on tuberculosis. They provide summary tables, detailed analytics to track your progress, and they integrate with Picmonic. You can even subscribe to TrueLearn and Picmonic together by clicking on this link. I have personally tried TrueLearn, I answered hundreds of questions, and my score was not too shabby. So what are you waiting for? Click on the link in the description or in the first comment and start practicing today. Thank you so much guys for watching and thank you TrueLearn for sponsoring this video. Check my cases playlist for more videos like this one. And as always, be safe, stay happy and study hard.